So why are we here? This, this statistic and statistics like this that we're all familiar with related to the role of the private sector in, in free violence and in tackling free violence. It's a critical role and we are an important community of practice mobilising around this statistic. In a, later this morning you'll hear from our Ministry of Health colleagues who are going to talk about uh, recognising the role and leveraging the private sector for the public health agenda. To do that role, it's not just the private sector, it's about a total market, it's about building a market. And in this project, we've really tried to view that whole market approach, recognising that the government is a steward of the markets in which we work, but we all have a role to play in that market. And this is the framework we've used, and you'll see this referred refer to and reflected on during the course of the day. We embarked on this project to expand and increase use of MRDTs at private sector points of care. So we've worked in five different country contexts, in five different health markets. The same health market, but in different countries. And we've learned a lot, and we've seen a lot of nuances. But across the board, the key market constraints for this particular health market have been around policy issues, quality assurance, both on the commodity and service delivery side, and then engagement and investment of the supply chain. So to benchmark ourselves against progress, to keep ourselves on track with the progress that we're making, and to not just have things where projects come and go and that's that, we've come up with a framework. It's called the Who Does Who Pays. And this is quite nice because it allows you to, at points in time, discuss and have conversations with all the stakeholders in the market about where we are in market development and discuss who's doing what. Are they the right market actors to be doing this? And where's the financing for this? And how can we go from the current state to a manageable state with financing in a certain time period to our vision of success? So we're going to be spending time this afternoon to talk about how do we get there? How do we move from the blue table to the green table. Uh, this is really a very important meeting, extremely important. We get about a billion fever cases by year. These fever cases have to be sorted out. And in 2010, um, WHO said correctly, recommended that uh, not all fevers are malaria. There has to be a parapsychological diagnosis, either through microscopy or RBT, depending on the level you are. The taking up of that policy has not been uniform across where we are supposed to be. We have to take cognizance of the fact that um, uh, 40, over 40% 40 of uh, our patients seek treatment in uh, private providers. So we need to support the private providers uh, in this endeavor of aggressive care and treatment. Today is a celebration to share how we can get this out of our way so that the road, the path to the fight against malaria is somehow not so bumpy, but small. But I want to thank uh, PSI, Malaria Consortium Foundation for Innovative New Diagnostics uh, John Hopkins of uh, WHO, of course, WHO, of course, and of course the countries, for being bold and say we have to uh, crack this nut. We cannot allow 40%, uh, in some, some situations, 60% of our populations to really work outside this beautiful policy that has been put forth by, by our, our WHO. Doing here today, we are celebrating where we are on a journey. We're not there yet. In fact, I want to bring us back to Stephanie's grey arrow. Do you remember that? How do we get from that blue framework box to the green framework box? That's really what today is all about. It's what's how are we going to get there? How are we going to leverage the learning from this project? Uh, to the best possible advantage to influence policy and practice to get us there. Because that's really what this is. This is a learning project. It's, it's, it's ultimately operational research. Over 44 research studies conducted by three partners, 
between 2013 and 2016. Uh, let's try and make sure that we are using this evidence at the country level, at the international level. Let us all become the advocates for this evidence to really make some more progress in this whole area of senior case management in the private sector. Because if we want universal access, that has to include a health sector-wide approach to malaria and fever case management. If we want to accelerate efforts towards elimination, we're not just going to eliminate in the public sector. Okay. What really has made this um, somewhat unique is, you know, this project wasn't about convening a group of experts, sitting in a room in Geneva, and coming up with the norms and standards, and then pushing those out to the regions and the countries and having them implement them. This was really what I think the best way I can describe it was a learning by doing journey. Okay, so we didn't have all the answers in the beginning. We hadn't reviewed all of the evidence, um, and we weren't sure what the obstacles were going to be um, as we moved along. The ultimate sort of output of this project and in our role is to try and um, distill all of the key learnings from this project and to put them into what we describe as the or what we have called the roadmap. Um, to really see how can other countries um, use the learnings from this project and the evidence that's been generated to, um, to accelerate um, similar initiatives in their own country. I think that this project, there's no question, it's been a catalyst for change. Many of the lessons that have been learned are common across the countries and as are the challenges. Um, and I think now our knowledge and, and recognition of these will continue to serve um, the project country so that they can continue to, to work towards change and also, as I said, we'll streamline initiatives in other countries. So uh, in Uganda, the private sector generally plays a very big role in provision of health services. Uh, in the private sector, especially in the rural based one, quality of care remains not very good. Majority of even mortalities happen in the, in the private sector. And if we want to control malaria at the community level, we shall have to intervene in all care provision uh, frameworks that exist. Uh, from what I've observed over time, we have built some level of understanding, some increased level of acceptance, we now have to move on very fast and move this to scale. All right. So access has to be universal, hundred percent, and we give uh, a, a very big importance to the two convenient operational platforms: the public sector and private sector. So, as far as the access is concerned, we regard that you cannot reach hundred percent access without involving the private sector. So. The major um, objective that will be the next uh, couple of years uh, is uh, uh, to increase uh, the, the capacity of the private sector to use uh, MRDT, uh, including the um, more informal uh, private sector that in Tanzania is called uh, uh, Agro, and Drug and Dispensing Outlets. Uh, so, um, our attempt is to increase the coverage, promote the access uh, to quality uh, services, uh, and um, we think that the, the private sector will, will play a pilot role uh, in the uh, next implementation uh, phase. So, actually, it has a program clear for the political national. Comment on va faire pour la subvention du secteur privé? So now it's uh, more or less clear actually how the government and the NCP are going uh, to include the private sector uh, into this system to, uh, so they can also get subsidies uh, for ACTs and uh, MRTTs. C'est la politique en général et je pense à uh, mon collègue au service prise en charge pour le programme que nous allons suivre maintenant. So actually they are continuing even after the UNITED project uh, to work with uh, uh, the private sector uh, to continue this project. 
Donc, euh, les RDP privés sont déjà, euh, très, euh, sont déjà disponibles au niveau des pharmacies, des dépôts des médicaments et des, 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 des cabinets privés qui ont été formés. So, uh, the RDT are now available in the pharmacies uh, and also available in the private uh, clinics. Fortunately, in 2014, or early 2015, the section was started by the Council of the PWA the PPMEs, which now allow the PPMEs to conduct uh, RDT as only invasive procedures. So now, RDT can be conducted in Nigeria. And uh, the country also has been promoting two supports and global funds and other partners. To promote the use of IPTs in the private sector. For now, so, uh, this UT project was the first attempt to try and engage private sector to follow the country's uh, policy in terms of fever management. This project, I'm um, uh, glad to talk about it because I've worked with it from the initiation up to where we are now, has actually opened. Not only to healthcare providers, but even to community members who now are able to seek for testing before treatment. This is an observation that really has helped us to ensure that uh, the quality of care given to our patients is actually being done as per our guidelines. We procured about 776. A thousand RDT in total, and uh, we sold uh, 671,000 RDT so far. And now you can see that at the beginning of the project, PSI uh, did almost all of the activities, Unitate was the only one there. We are confident that within three years, the Case management with our digital private sector will continue without PSI, without NGO, but only NSP and the MOH as a leader and the public sector as a donor. Thank you. The number of people who actually seek care and received um, any test at all increased from 27 to 30% which means the vision is catching up. But if you look at the uh, chart on the right, it shows that, you know, out of those who even get tested, between the two surveys, the use of RBT increased from 8% to 17%. And this captures the essence of the opportunities that are available in the private sector. The common goal we are looking at achieving is health impact. Let's make sure that whatever it is that we're putting out there, we have trained people to get it done. We have uh, probability assurance to monitor, and then we have a way of documenting the success stories in the end. And as, as we see, the current seeking care for the fever that we see in the test is more or less the same as from project and non project. But when you go to the those who are seeking care uh, for fever and receive an RIT, the, the number doubles. It makes it show how the project brings the impact to these outlets. In Uganda, there has generally been an increase in the number of people who are being tested. In 2013, we had 52%, which has increased to 20 uh, to 82% in 2016. This is, we are not about any test. You walk in, either microscopy or as long as they talk about the test. What about specifically for, uh, for RBT? This has also increased. We can see from 18 uh, to 72%, which is a, a fourfold increment in the number of people who are actually being tested. Now, in regards to case management, uh, generally, we can see that the case management has been high uh, from the start. Uh, out of those people who test positive, those who are getting uh, SCTs, uh, 
uh, has increased from 66 to 82 percent. But then when you talk about those who come out negative, it has generally been about 70. This is over 70 percent of the people that are managed very well. So the quality control uh, tools actually developed by fund during these projects uh, are the troubleshooting guides, uh, the protocol to microphone in uh, RDT problems, and uh, the PCWs for monitoring uh, RDT activities. Uh, so at the moment, uh, this troubleshooting guide is finalized. Uh, we'll be sharing actually the document with the stakeholders in the different countries involved in the project. Uh, but also in other countries that are not in the project. Um, we have developed also that protocol uh, to act on um, RDT programs in the field. Uh, so the goal with this protocol actually was to uh, provide a framework uh, on how to respond to these uh, quality anomalies, uh, those uh, quality anomalies that we have listed in the troubleshooting guide, uh, to define actually who does report the project and to whom these uh, uh, problems uh, should be reported. So the last step we wanted to develop is this uh, positive control wells uh, to be able also to test the quality of uh, this uh, RBT at uh, uh, the point of use. Um, we are currently also working at collecting information about the regulation of uh, RBT in the different countries and also uh, what would be the regulation if you wanted to introduce these positive control wells uh, in the countries. And so and one of our tasks in this program was to do a qualitative evaluation in between the pilot and scale up phase to understand what our provider's perception of RDT is now that we've had about, about two plus years with the program, um, what are their experiences in the program, and how does this influence their use. So some of the preliminary findings that we have. So overall, we found a very positive reception of this program. Providers expressed a great interest in seeing this program continue. We were asking, what's going to happen after? You know, here is ending, please don't stop. So, um, a few things that did pop out is in both countries, providers describe this issue of discordance. And so, um, several people have mentioned before is it goes back to the confidence providers have in these tests when they compare the, let's say, negative results of an RDT and then compare that to a positive across the piece of the test that is the current gold standard and also what they see in the presentation. So this is still um, a hurdle that we have to get over and increase in provider trust. But as we also know, good microphones can be done well. It is hard to come by. So that's just uh, thrown into the larger context. Some more findings. Um, we found that a lot of providers when asked about the grants available, only were able to tell us about the one or two or two grants that are offered by the project. Um, we're not sure if this is the full picture. Um, I know some countries have done value chain analysis to try and expand on what grants are available, but it's something to consider as we move forward into the next phase. And then, um, as has been mentioned before, previous assessments have found issues with RDT. So these are the dry alcohol swabs, buffers with no buffer in them, and also faulty pipettes, but it seems to be resolved. Lastly, uh, providers were not familiar with the troubleshooting guide, but as you heard from Christian's presentation earlier, the guides would, um, have not made it to the provider level yet, so they have been submitted to the uh, They said the purpose of the roadmap, which is a guidance document, the purpose is to assist governments and departments in the development of country specific operational plans for the implementation of quality assured in other priorities in the country's private sectors. The uh, global roadmap was part of the um, initial plan of this project. It was a part of the project mandate of sharing and disseminating and learning. And this is the current outline of the global roadmap. A lot of uh, fine print, but let me just walk you through it. The first quality is about country stewardships and um, getting getting uh, national governments and relevant stakeholders on board. The second column is about adapting national plans and strategies 
so that you can make private sector uh, private se uh, sector markets work for IoT testing, testing in country. And then the third call is about implementing these adaptive financing strategies into the country's uh, operational plans. And then, of course, monitoring and scaling up. So our five ideas, five ideas for Uganda, uh, we consider the extension of the waiver for drug shops and uh, pharmacies to test. Two, we are looking at uh, policy review. Here we gather all evidence, disseminate, and share the information together with the NMCP, Ministry of Health, to help them as well push it further. Uh, on the, we are looking also at PCC and promotion. Apparently, MC has been wicked. So we see we'll guide the private sector to carry on the plan already had. They adopt it, change, tweak it a little bit here and there to suit the current situation, and then they'll be able to carry on. Um, point number four, we're looking at securing bridging funding. This will help in transition from the current situation to the desired situation. Um, lastly, we are looking at continuous professional development. Here we will engage the professional bodies to see how they are able to carry on uh, the e-learning module that we developed and we are using to train the providers, see how the take it up, who will be able to pay, and uh, probably suggest that the providers contribute for funding of the, of the e-learning uh, sessions. We should have a stakeholders meeting first. Uh, that can give us the what we need comprehensively, and it will include even the um, uh, professional body, is uh, all the stakeholders, including the, the consumer groups and everything. So from that point, we will come up with those consultative ideas, how I many consultative meetings, so that we can start. Uh, we can have a decision uh, in the country. So technical meetings and the policy makers meetings. That's the thing that we will use uh, as, as, as approach. Secondly, um, the enforcement of the existing laws. You know, you can start with the, your meetings and everything and locating, but there are some existing laws which, if they are enforced well, they can support even your uh, strategy to come up. Third, the private uh, sector uh, discussions. Um, should be elevated to national malaria and uh, case management committees. We say four. Uh, we say again, from the education part, we can try to go with the consultative idea, consultative meetings, and uh, whatever, but in the quality assurance part, it's better to strengthen the curriculum, the existing curriculum from the colleges and universities. Uh, the fifth uh, is about uh, including the uh, quality assurance activities. Uh, from the local government, we are talking about the council level, I'm not sure, from the district level, if we can be in the same page from other countries. So what do we need to do to move from that green so that we will identify the number of things? Now, there's the overwhelming need for stakeholder engagement. Um, we've been having that in the course of the project, but most of the time, it is the donor agencies that happen to be heading it. Maybe for one last time, we could actually bring them together and tell them this is the reality. There's no more funding. You guys will have to take up this market. We also believe that by so doing, the manufacturers and their representatives will be encouraged to set aside marketing and location. Currently, as it is on the project, all the demand creation activities have been done by the implementing partners. But going forward, the manufacturers and their representatives will have to take this. We also believe that the, there is an overwhelming need to end the public sector subsidy. The Nigeria experience makes this very, very important. For as long as the, there is the public sector subsidy, the market will continue to be unattractive. And so we also believe that Part of the grey arrow that will take us across from blue to green is to increase the capacity, the technical capacity, and in some way reorientate the mindset 
of the regulatory agencies currently, especially with respect to quality assurance. And also, also um, we want to agree with what our Tanzanian, uh, sorry, our Ugandan colleagues said. And we need to move from a waiver to a policy in position. So, so for Madagascar, there are uh, two steps. And our aim is to uh, include the sector, uh, the private sector in our system first, and to do how to do to do report and to, to make a, a correct uh, case management for sector. There are two steps for us in private sector. There will go to the full seller and the full seller provides the officine or drug store or private sector in the birth in the birth direction for us for the new model model funding we have some fund to global fund until June 2016 to December 2017, we will do such version in our in our uh, we do some subvention in our tracks for malaria and for training and training and uh, supply chain will be subvention by new model of investment and after the global new model model of funding we will the full seller will support the will support the, the uh, to buy the drug to the company and after our system support the training in all this supply chain so we start with policy. We have had a, a series of discussions as, uh, as, as we were discussed earlier, but we are thinking we need a higher level of engagement, which has been lacking in the past. So we see this as ensuring uh, that if it does take place, it's going to harmonize all the regulations that are in place, and then we are going to be one happy family. When it comes to demand and supply side, we have, in Kenya currently, we have different people doing different communications. So we do not have a synergized um, platform where that is SCSM led. So we think that is something that we can, that can be strengthened by M M MOH. And so that all the communication to do with diagnostics is led and even financed through SCSM. So the other thing we thought, the, and we are green, and we think we put our manufacturers and first and buyers on the table on, on task, is what do you bring on the table when it comes to this space of ACSM? So they already doing medical detailing. So the question is, how, what could what could it take for them to ensure medical detailing on RDT is taken care of? And so what we were discussing is how do we negotiate the current margins? So then we have the, the last one, we, we talk about quality assurance. And what do we do? We've, we've got a, we've had in the recent past a very lengthy discussions and a lot of stakeholder engagement in coming up with a quality assurance implementation plan. And it has been led by our very own uh, Mr. Morege uh, and his own lead. So, what you were saying going forward is that we need to implement it, we need to actualize it. Then, the other thing we thought uh, that is very important is the whole idea about uh, engagement of professional associations, these are the nurses, these are the pharmacists, how do we strengthen that? Because that's an opportunity. Because they have frequent um, they have frequent engagement with their members on an annual basis. And so that has been a good space in Kenya, but we see a lot of room to, to strengthen this. And also learning from other countries like Uganda who have made this a strong case for them as well. I would like to say thank you for today. Thank you for an amazing project and thank you for the chance to keep working with you as amazing, talented, committed people on this agenda. I look forward to the times ahead as we all do. PSI is completely committed to this agenda. 
Um, and I know, um, I, yeah, I know you all are as well. So we have good times ahead of us and fun. And uh, thank you. Give great thanks. All the best.